All right, uh, it is time for our panel on Noragami. So we are gonna switch over to that. Um, it's a shorter panel, so it'll go for about half an hour. And then we will hopefully get the panelists on the horn virtually to talk more about that. So we will see that in um, uh, hopefully in a little bit, but now a bit about Noragami and Shinto. Welcome to Noragami, a crash course in Shintoism on Con Edition. I go by a tuple one half on Twitter. You can also find me on YouTube as a tuple. This presentation is basically supposed to be a light primer on Shinto through the lens of the anime Noragami. If you aren't familiar with Noragami or if you haven't seen it, don't worry. I don't think that sitting through this will ruin the show for you. I'm mostly talking about who characters are, not so much the events of the plot. But just to be fair, here's your spoiler warning for Noragami and Noragami Argoto. I'm just going to be talking about the anime. I'm not going to be covering the manga, though the manga is quite good. I do recommend that you check it out. I'm not going to be talking about Yato's identity or anything like that, but I am going to be ruining the endings of some Japanese myths. So if you haven't finished reading your ancient sacred texts, I will be spoiling those. So that said, let's get into it. So what is Shinto? Shinto is Japan's native religion. It is a broad amalgamation of all of these ancient local folk religions that became more and more uniform to one another over time and eventually came together to create Shinto as we know it today. Shinto is really, really old, like archaeological evidence dating back to 300 BC old. It has no known founder and no single text as its basis. So there's no equivalent to Jesus or the Bible in Shinto. There are texts about Shinto though, the oldest surviving being the Kojiki, which is from 712 AD, and eight years later, there's the Nihon Shoki. But these are not scriptures. These are essentially record books from those times, recording things like important events and important people and important folklore. So for a lot of the myths in Shinto, these are considered the main primary sources for them. Shinto is unique in that it has not really left Japan. It hasn't spread the same way other religions have. However, a lot of religions have come to Japan and influenced Shinto. In particular, Buddhism. A lot of Shinto gods are borrowed from Buddhism, but it's also influenced by Hinduism, Taoism, Confucianism, basically any neighboring religion. But pretty much everyone in Japan takes part in Shinto in one way or another. Even if you're not religious, you probably still visit a shrine at least once a year, probably for New Year's. Everyone in Japan also takes part in Buddhism in one way or another, but because of the time and scope of this presentation, I'm not going to be delving into Buddhism, I'm just going to be focusing on Shinto. So because Shinto is so ingrained into Japanese culture, it's easier to think of it as a nationwide set of traditions as opposed to a religion in the Western sense. I also think it's important to mention state Shinto. Shinto became the official religion of Japan from the Meiji era to World War II, and this was a tactic to rally patriotism to the point that Shinto is still kind of associated with right-wing politics politics even today. So one of the most important elements of Shinto is kami. Kami basically means gods. The Kojiki defines kami as any being whatsoever which possesses some eminent quality out of the ordinary and is awe-inspiring, which, you know, is pretty vague. Collectively, the Shinto gods are referred to as yaoyoruzu no kami, the eight million gods, basically implying that there are infinite gods. Shinto gods can take the form of all sorts of things from ancestral ghosts to natural features like mountains and rivers, but basically in theory, anything can have a kami. My computer can have a kami. The chair you're sitting in could have a kami. 
Oncon could have a Kami. A Kami is just a watch over Oncon. So you can see how the number of gods adds up very quickly and how it's no wonder that some of them get forgotten. And this is where we get the premise for Noragami, which means stray god. So even though there are so many gods, Shinto does have a primary mythology with primary gods. So if you're going to know any myths from Shinto mythology, these are the ones you should know. So first we have Izanami and Izanagi. Izanami is the female, Izanagi is the male. Together they stirred the ocean with a jeweled spear, and when they pulled it out of the water, the drops off the tip splashed in the ocean and created the main island of Japan. The two then went there, got married, and had lots of children, some of which were other gods, some of them were the other islands of Japan, and this is basically Japan's creation myth. And this myth was taught as history in Japan until World War II. So Izanami and Izanagi, they are having a great time until Izanami gives birth to the fire god, and she is horribly burned and dies and goes to a place called Yomi. Yomi is underground, it is very dark, and lots of monsters live there. It is essentially the underworld. Izanagi misses his wife and goes to Yomi to get her back. He finds her and she says, I can't go back with you because I've already eaten the food here. And those are the rules. Once you eat the food, you can't leave. But she says, wait here. I'm going to try to work something out with the guys in charge. But whatever you do, don't look at me. So what does Izanagi do? He lights a fire and looks at her and realizes that she is a rotting corpse. So he hightails it out of there. Izanami is angered by this and gives chase, but Izanagi outruns her and seals the entrance to Yomi with a giant boulder so she cannot get out. Peeved off by this, Izanami says from behind the boulder that she is going to kill a thousand people a day because of this. And Izanagi replies that he will make sure 1,500 people a day are born. So here we get Shinto's explanation for the life and death cycle, but this myth also illustrates the important point that Kami are not these perfect ethereal beings. They are very human, they have human emotions, they have human reactions, they can get hurt, and they can die. Another cool thing about this myth is that Yomi is a real place, or at least its entrances. The top image is how it's portrayed in the show, the bottom two are photos of the real location, so you can go and see the big rock that Izanagi supposedly put there. And no, you're not allowed to try to move it. So in Noragami, we go to Yomi and meet Izanami. You can see that she has the rotting flesh thing going on in that top picture. She is very lonely, and she wants her guests to eat so that way they get stuck there the same way she is. Uh, she commands an army of shikome, or hags of the underworld. In some variations of the myth, she sent an army of hags to chase after Izanagi, and he still outran them. And she also has this very long, creepy, moving hair that tries to reach out and grab you. This is not an ability that is solely associated with Izanami in Japan. Female ghosts have very long, dark hair with supernatural properties. So Izanami has this ability in the show essentially because she's a dead woman. After Izanagi left Yomi, he was very germy because Yomi is a very unclean place and he had to cleanse himself. And when he washed his left eye, Amaterasu, the sun goddess, was born. When he washed his right, the moon god Tsukiyomi was born, and when he washed his nose, Susano, the storm god, was born. Amaterasu and Susano end up having this really intense sibling rivalry going on, and Susano being a storm god, when he throws fits, things get very messy. So after one of Susano's fits, where he messed up a ton of Amaterasu's stuff, she says, I've had it, I'm going into this cave, and I'm taking the sun with me. Good luck living in darkness. 
everybody realizes that this is terrible and they need to find a way to get her out. So they throw a very loud party and make it sound like they're having tons of fun to try to make Amaterasu want to come out of the cave. She does get curious from the noise and peeks out from the cave. And when she does this, they immediately put a mirror in front of her face. And Amaterasu is this beautiful sun goddess. So she is totally entranced by her own reflection and they're able to lure her out of the cave and seal it behind her, giving the world sunlight once again. Amaterasu goes on to become the highest rank deity in Shinto. Her shrines are very big, very pretty, very well maintained. She is also believed to be the ultimate ancestress of the imperial line, that is, until the emperor denounced his divinity after World War II. So Amaterasu is not hanging out on Earth with everybody else. She is up in a place called Takamagahara. Takamagahara is in the sky. It is connected to the earth by a bridge that some people interpret as a rainbow. This is where the gods live. It's where they gather to meet. In the show, it's where Bishamon's giant estate is that is not like hidden in the backyard of one of her shrines. It is understood to be up in the sky. This is also where Yato's tiny piece of land is. And Takamagahara is traditionally depicted with golden clouds and very traditional Japanese architecture. You can kind of see in the top left image the big red columns and the people in the background dressed in traditional court garb and how the color gold is incorporated everywhere as well. Now, since Amaterasu is in charge, when she decides someone is going to become emperor, he is going to become emperor. And that brings us to the three talismans of sovereignty. The mirror that was used to lure her out of the cave, a magic sword that Susano found after slaying a serpent, and a fertility jewel that Susano used in a baby-making contest against Amaterasu. As I said, they had a very intense sibling rivalry. These three items were supposedly given to the first emperor by the gods in order to prove his sovereignty over the land. These are real-life items that are referred to as the imperial regalia. This is not a picture of them. This is an artist's interpretation of what they might look like. There are no photos of these items. There are no drawings. The only people allowed to see them are the emperor and his, like, highest-ranked Shinto priests. So you can imagine them to look like whatever you want. I prefer Sailor Moon's version myself. But this idea of regalia, items that are sacred to the gods, this comes up in Noragami. So regalia and Noragami are the dead souls of humans that have the ability to turn into tools for the gods' use usually a weapon, and in Japanese, they're called shinki. Shinki has multiple meanings in Japanese. It can be used to refer to gods themselves. It can be used to refer to a newly crafted item, and it can also be used to refer to the imperial regalia. It's a play off of these ideas of items that are important to the gods, but also these lives that have been crafted into something new after death. Now, let's take a look at some of the gods that wield regalia in the show. First up is Ebisu. The traditional depiction is on the left, Noragami's depiction is on the right. He is one of the seven gods of fortune and is the only one out of the seven that is derived from Japanese mythology. The rest are derived from Buddhism and Hinduism. He was originally named Hiruko, and he was the first child of Izanami and Izanagi. But he was born without bones, so they threw him away. Then he grew his bones back, as one does, and he became the kami of fishermen and merchants, and was renamed Ebisu. 
He doesn't look very similar to his traditional depiction. His regalia are his coat and gloves. He's very clumsy because of the whole no bones thing, so they help him with dexterity, and he shares some of his personality with the traditional god, where he's very honest and very difficult to anger. Next we have Bishamonten, also one of the seven gods of fortune. She is the kami of warriors, or he. The biggest difference between the traditional depiction and Noragami's is that traditionally Bishamonten is a man, but Noragami's version is a woman. I'm not entirely sure why she's dressed like a sexy cop, but I do have a theory. So if you look at the traditional depiction, you can see that he's stepping on some enemies. So I think they took the idea of stepping on people and ran with it. That is my theory. So Bishamonten is derived from one of Buddhism's four heavenly kings. He is a great warrior that has amassed a huge horde of treasures and weapons over the course of his journeys, and he always triumphs over evil. And we see this reflected in Noragami's version, where Bishamonten has so many regalia at her disposal. She's also very dignified and holds herself to a high standard to the point of being obsessed with triumphing over evil, which becomes a problem when she thinks Siato is evil. So next we're going to go over the rest of the gods of fortune. They aren't very important in the anime, most of them don't even have lines, but I still want to go over them. First up is Daikokuten. He is the god of commerce. Traditionally, he has a sack of goodies over his shoulder and a mallet that is sometimes called the magic mallet or the money mallet. And in the show, he kind of looks like your shady uncle running the festival booth. I'm not sure why. Maybe because those are associated with making money? But he's holding a bunny, and the reason he's holding a bunny is because Daikokuten is also known as Okuninushi. And Okuninushi has a tale about him where he helped a rabbit, and in return the rabbit gave him some good fortune. And if you go to some of his shrines, sometimes they have adorable bunny statues. And in the show, he just really likes rabbits. Then we have Ebisu, who I already went over. Then we have Ben Ten, the goddess of music and art. She looks really similar to her traditional depiction, but if you look closely at her chest, you can see that she has a little tattoo of a treble clef that they added. Then we have Bishamonten, who I already went over. Then we have Fukurokuju, the god of wisdom and wealth. So you might think that he has that fancy top hat to show off how wealthy he is, but actually it's to hide his giant forehead. He has a really big forehead. That is how you recognize him in traditional art. So yeah, the hat is not to be fancy, it's to cover that up. Next is Hote, who we know in the West as the Laughing Buddha. He is a god of happiness and health. He looks really similar to his traditional depiction in origami. They gave him some hair, that's about it. Then we have Jurjin, the god of longevity, who in traditional depictions is a little old man with a cane, and in origami he's a little old man with a cane. Then during New Year's, they all get in a big flying boat and pass out presents to the good children. I have no idea how this works in real life because Japanese kids don't get presents for New Year's. They get cold, hard cash from their relatives. But that's the story. Uh, the Seven Gods of Fortune, they get in a boat and bring presents. <laughs> Next up is Kofuku. Kofuku is a bimbogami. She's a kami of poverty. These are traditionally depicted as really dirty old men that have nothing to their name except a hand fan, and that's why her regalia is a fan. 
Bimbogami are not worshipped. They possess people and houses and bring very bad luck. So in the show, she goes by the name Kofuku Ebisu. Ebisu after the god of fortune. Kofuku means little fortune in Japanese. And she hopes that by using this name, people will mistake her for a kami of fortune instead of a kami of misfortune and maybe not try to run her away. Next is Tenjin. Tenjin was a real person. He looks really similar to his traditional depiction. His actual name was Michizane, and he lived during the 9th century. He was a scholar, a poet, and a politician. But he fell victim to some dirty politics, so they fired him, exiled him, and he died in exile. Soon after his death, a huge storm came and devastated the capital. It caused a lot of fires, it destroyed the homes of his political rivals, it killed some of his political rivals, and the imperial court went, Oh my god, Michizane's ghost must be pissed. And in order to placate his spirit, they restored his family's former status, burned his order of exile, and deified him. And he is now the Kami of Learning. He is one of the most popular gods in Japan. That's one of his shrines in Tokyo. Very big, very pretty. And students will go to his shrines to pray for good grades. That's a very common thing to do if you have a big test coming up. So in the show, Tenjin knows he's a big deal and he's kind of full of himself. In that screen cap, you can see all these wooden blocks behind him. Those are Emma. They're these wooden talismans that you can write your wishes on and then leave them at the shrine to hopefully have them granted. Those are some Emma from a Tenjin shrine in the bottom right photo. They have bulls on them because he is also associated with bulls. But we can see that Tenjin got off really good in the afterlife, which kind of begs the question of, well, what about everyone else? So Shinto is not very specific when it comes to the afterlife, but essentially when you die, your soul is a kami, and you become a kami that looks over your descendants. So there's ancestor worship in Shinto. It's common for homes to have this little shrine on a high shelf called a kamidana. It's dedicated to your ancestors, and you might leave little offerings there or decorate it for special times of the year. I have a picture of Yato's little shrine because it kind of looks like a kamidana. There are also funeral rites in Shinto, but no one even bothered to write them down until the 1800s. And considering how old Shinto is, that's kind of ridiculous. But something important about Japanese funerals is usually that the dead are buried or cremated in these white robes. So if you're ever wearing a kimono or a yukata, you want to make sure that you do left over right because right over left is reserved for dead people. Um, I recently came up with a personal mnemonic to help remember this, uh, where left over right, tie your OB tight, right over left, you'll be left for dead. Uh, I don't know how useful that might be to other people, but that's what I've been using. So as soon as we see the characters of Yukine and Nora on screen, we immediately know that they are dead because of how they are dressed. Nora has this interesting triangle headband. We don't actually know what those are, but we know that they were popular during the Heian period and that they show up a lot in art of ghosts, mostly from that period. There's theories that they were meant to ward off evil spirits and stuff like that, but what this is supposed to tell us about Nora's character is that she's probably been dead for a long time, so it kind of adds to her mystery. Then we have Tokoyo, the far shore, literally meaning eternalness, forever unchanging. This is the distant land across the sea, and it is the world of the dead. And in Noragami, this is where spirits can dwell and become corrupted and become phantoms. So in the Japanese, phantoms are referred to as ayakashi. 
Ayakashi has three meanings. The first is that it's a type of ghostly monster or yokai. Um, it's also used to describe any supernatural phenomenon that is related to the sea, and it's also a mask in no. No is a type of traditional Japanese theater where all the characters wear specific types of masks. And an ayakashi is the mask for a male ghost or wrathful god. It's that terrifying picture in the top right. Masks are also kind of important in Shinto in general. People wear them for fun during festivals, but they also wear them for rituals. That red mask with the long nose is a tengu mask. Tengu are believed to be the servants of gods. So sometimes when there's a procession, someone might dress up as a tengu and help lead it and wear a mask like the one in the photo. So in Noragami, phantoms are these ghostly monsters from the far shore, so they're related to the sea, and you can control them with masks, and they're very wrathful and scary. So Noragami is playing off of all these different ideas that surround the word Ayakashi. Shrines are a huge component of Shintoism, so if you want to go to a shrine, you're probably going to ask for some good luck, or maybe you have a wish you want to be granted, or maybe you're just going because it's New Year's and everyone else is going. But if you want to go to a shrine, you probably first have to pass through a tori. A tori is a big arch and it's meant to act as a gateway that marks where you enter into the territory of a kami. Yato, of course, wants a really big fancy one. That one in the upper right is Japan's most famous tori. It's really big, it's in water, you have to use a boat to go through it. But not all tori are fancy, especially if you go out into the countryside. A lot of them are simple, they aren't even painted red, so they come in a lot of shapes and sizes. You might also see shide hanging off of them, those zigzag white pieces of paper. They are there to mark the presence of a kami. So once you pass through the tori, you still can't go up to the shrine. First you want to clean your hands and mouth. There's going to be some sort of fountain or trough that has fresh water in it and a wooden ladle so you can clean your hands and mouth before approaching the shrine. Purifying with water comes up a lot in Shinto. We see it in Noragami where Yato uses it to help cure his blight. So you can finally go up to the shrine and you're probably going to want to give an offering. You are essentially bribing the kami to grant your wishes. Common offerings are food, alcohol, or money. The traditional offering is a 5 yen coin. And 5 yen is nothing. It's about 4 cents, give or take, whatever the current exchange rate is. But the reason that 5 yen is the traditional offering is because 5 yen in Japanese, goen, is a homophone with goen as in the word for fate. So when you give a kami a 5 yen coin, you are symbolically placing your fate in that kami's hands. You're saying that you trust them with your fate, and that's why Yato is so happy when someone gives him a 5 yen coin, because it means that people trust him and are showing their respect to him. So you will approach an offering box, put your coin in, there might be a bell attached with a rope above it, you can ring the bell to get the kami's attention, and then you can pray. And the standard way of praying in Shinto is bow twice, clap twice, pray, and then bow again when you're done. This method became standard during state Shinto, and before that there were a bunch of local variations. Shrines are not just buildings, there's the mikoshi, the portable shrine that people carry around during festivals, and I already mentioned the kamidana, the small shrine in your home, so that's something else that comes in a lot of shapes and sizes. So you visited the shrine, and while you were there, you might have seen a shimenawa, which is a rope meant to enclose a sacred space and protect it. We see one of these around Robo's tree. You see them a lot around trees. 
They can be very small, like the photo on the left with the stump, or very big to give you an idea of scale. Look in the lower right corner. That is a person posing under a very famous Shimenawa at a shrine in Izumo. You also might see a Miko or a shrine maiden. Yato wants to have lots of Miko to pamper him and take care of all of his needs, but Miko do not serve the gods quite that directly. They essentially do odd jobs around the shrine. They help keep it clean. They also help with rituals, most notable the Kagura dance, which is a dance with a bell instrument that has a ribbon attached to it. That top middle photo, you can see some Miko practicing the Kagura dance. You see Miko in anime all the time, but they are not actually the ones in charge. The ones in charge are the Kanushi, or Shinto priests. You don't see these in anime very often, presumably because they are not cute girls. Like, there's Rei's grandpa in Sailor Moon, and that's kind of it. But they are the ones running the show, they are the ones operating the shrine and leading the rituals. So you might want to get a souvenir from the shrine, like a lucky charm. Larger shrines will have things for sale, like omamori, which are these little satchels and you can buy them for all kinds of good luck in school or career or love. Uh, I already mentioned Emma. You can pretty much write whatever you want on Emma or draw whatever, so it's actually pretty common to see anime characters on them, and some shrines totally embrace this. Uh, one example, there's a shrine that gets a lot of tourism because of the anime Anohana, so they have these pre-made Anohana Emma that you can get. You might also want to get a fortune, especially if it's New Year's. So from what I've read, this can vary depending on where you are. Sometimes they'll have a certain tree or a big fence that you can tie your fortune to, and depending on local tradition, you might get a good fortune and you want to tie it to let the kami know that you approve of it. Uh, you might get a bad fortune and tie it because you don't want to take it with you, you want to leave it at the shrine, uh, and sometimes you just tie it no matter what, so this can vary. Yato loves all sorts of lucky charms, whether they work or not. And a big theme in Shinto overall is just repetition and routine. So whether or not you passed your last test, you might still be going to the Tenjin Shrine to pray every time. Or whether or not your fortune from last year was accurate, you're still going to get another one every New Year's. Uh, Shinto is not really about faith in the same way that other religions are, as much as it's about honoring tradition, and leaving your fate up to your local kami, whatever that may be. Thanks for watching. I hope you learned something. Again, I'm Otuple on YouTube um, or Otuple one half on Twitter. And uh, yeah, have a good OnCon. And we are back. That was Noragami. This is the panelist behind the Noragami panel. I uh, want to introduce yourself. That is awesome. And uh, folks in the chat, let us know. Oh, uh, we are having audio issues, so one second. Always something, you know. Um, so we will double check. That is coming in. That should be fine. Um, let us try something, and we will get there. So we need a probably. Uh, we'll try that. Um, Nope. Nope. 
Uh, oops, that's not going to work. Hold on. Um, we will try this instead. And we will pull that from there. We'll see if that works. Uh, all right, we'll see if that works. Um, all right, uh, give us a try there on audio. That doesn't... It doesn't look like that's, coming, that's working either. So give me just a minute. Sorry. Yep. Sorry. Yes, yeah, Skype is apparently coming in on a different audio channel. So I've just got to figure out a way of grabbing that. So always a little something unusual. Um, could we do... It's interesting. Normally there is another... Well, we'll try this one. Boop. And then we will use... Um, that might be it. And transition over to that. Um, all right, let's give that a try. Ah, still nothing. This is really annoying. Oh, dang, I hate when this happens. Um, oh, maybe I need to hold on. Uh, that, that could be it. Yeah, different thing. Um, transition over there. Ah, that might be a little bit better. Um, give that a try. Okay, so can you hear me now? Is it working yet? That looks like it's working. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, quick reintroduction. Uh, hi, I'm Mary Minton. Uh, and yeah, I've been trying to make more anime stuff for uh, YouTube and videos and stuff of late. Yeah, uh, and doing a great job of it. Um, um, so, Noragami, I know, is an anime that's uh, near and dear to you. Um, um, one of the things that always interests me about like religion in anime is how how it's presented because sometimes it's kind of you know it's there but it's not meant to be realistic. Sometimes it's meant to be realistic but it's not really there. Um, and it seems to me that Noragami like like manages to to walk that line really well. Where Shinto is obviously a, a really important part of it, um, but you also recognize that there's a, a certain you know shonen-y aspect to uh, uh, to the anime. Is, is that reasonably accurate? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's ultimately an urban fantasy. It's kind mm. of, you know, how um, are these ancient gods supposed to operate uh, with modern society the way that it is? Um, and kind of uh, with the whole premise that, uh, you know, Yato was this god that was really important back in the day for certain reasons. Um, and now he's not because uh just life in japan has changed society has changed um and yeah so it's um kind of a nice mix of you know visuals and actions but also incorporating all of this you know ancient folklore it's an interesting point you brought up because i know folks have talked a lot about how um uh modern japanese people um aren't religious um um, but there's still a lot of ritual in modern Japanese society. How much, are, how much do they like touch on that specifically in the show, the idea that people are still kind of going through the motions, if you will, but how much like faith is there? Um, I mean, I think it sort of um, is what I tried to touch on in the presentation, yeah. where uh, like you don't really think of it as like faith in the sense of mm. like, belief and like you know going to church every sunday it's yeah. just kind of this thing that's like there mm -hmm. in japan i mean there's like a shrine on every corner yeah. um and you know it's not just uh religious things that are rituals i mean there's all these little rituals yeah. in japanese culture every day making sure to you know take your shoes off when you're inside doing mm -hmm. um you know your little greetings and isatsu every day um where there's all these little like micro rituals in Japanese culture, and that's kind of because um, of how Shinto is practiced as well. Um, and so people say they're not religious, but it's like you know they had a coming of age ceremony. They mm -hmm. you know are going to shrines on a regular basis. They're you know visiting their family for oban, um, and so it's sort of interesting where uh it's just a different type of faith yeah. like um where it's it's like there but it's not because it's just so omnipresent that mm. you almost don't notice it
Gotcha. That's interesting. And that also tracks with the representations I've seen of it in, like, historical movies and so forth and so on, where Shinto, even in the Edo period, was just a thing you did. Um, you know, and obviously there was, there was a, perhaps a stronger belief in the supernatural aspects of it. Um, or, or I guess a, a stronger, like, direct day-to-day belief. Um, yeah. But, uh, but, but still, it was kind of this, like you said, this background ritual kind of thing that, that, that happened. Um, what are, uh, are there other anime featuring Shinto that you um, particularly like or find particularly um, remarkable? Uh, absolutely. So I actually have a lot of recommendations. Okay. Yeah, um, nice. So I, I have four anime and two games. Cool. Okay. Uh, so uh, first, uh, you know, a lot of people have already seen this, but My Neighbor Totoro. Oh, um, yeah. Because huh. I think it's so interesting to rewatch and going into it with uh kind of the idea of this is a story about kids that get to meet a kami um because you you have totoro's tree and it has the shiminawa around it um and it's kind of they move to this new town and the you know local kami essentially like greets them Mm -hmm. and so i think it's so charming to rewatch Totoro kind of with that in mind. And also a lot of people still haven't seen it. Yeah, um, that's true. So if you haven't seen it, like that's another good excuse to watch <laughs> it. Um, another one that I really love is uh, Kamisama Kiss. That's also, uh, the manga is also quite good. Um, and it's a reverse harem anime, but it's about a girl that um, the local land god has gone missing, and so she gets recruited to be oh. in his place, and she gets like uh, all these fun, uh, like little servants, and like uh, has all this hijinks with local yokai and stuff. Nice. Um, and yeah, that that's a really fun one. And if you like, uh, they even have like some OVAs that uh, animate like the ending of the manga and stuff, and it's it's like it's just like a good, satisfying watch. Nice. Um, there's also um, Inari Konkon, which I always like, kind of describe as like it's Himitsu no Akko-chan meets Kitsune Magic, okay. um, where it's like she she gets these like. Kitsune uh, transformative powers, and it's like a little magical girl-ish. Not really. It's kind of more about her putting on these disguises mm. um, and the hijinks with that. Um, but it, you get all these beautiful shots of mm. like um, the local Inari shrine, and uh, yeah, it's just um, it's just a really nice uh, put together show. Mm. Um, and then I also uh, really like uh, Matoy the Sacred Slayer, which is like mm. a semi-recent, pretty obscure uh, magical girl anime uh, that is not the best writing-wise, uh, but it's Shinto-themed, where the main character, her powers, uh, she basically just like calls on the power of the kami that are near her, mm. and because the idea is that Kami are everywhere. She just starts pulling uh, like these beams of light from like vending machines and grass and all the nearby <laughs> buildings and the pavement. And so she ends up incredibly overpowered um, because just it's that same idea of like Kami are everywhere. Mm. Um, it has like a really bad uh, death flag in it <laughs> and like. Um, it's got a lot of fan service, mm-hmm. but it's also like it's it's just so unique mm-hmm. um, that you know I like it stands out in my mind yeah. for like what it's trying to do. <laughs> um, cool. Yeah, and then uh, game wise, uh, I always recommend people like Persona Four just in general. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, the Persona series is so, like, mainstream at this point because, yeah. like, everybody's played Persona 5. Uh, and Persona 4 uh, is finally on Steam, so, mm. like, more accessible than ever. Um, but, yeah, I always pitch it to people saying, like, it's like Pokemon because, <laughs> like, you uh, have, like, your, your little guys and, and you're fighting and it's turn-based. Um, but, like, your starter is Izanagi. So I, I always recommend it to people that are interested in like Japanese mythology and mythology in general because it, it is mythology from everywhere. 
cool. incorporated into it. But Persona 4 specifically is like Japanese mythology themed. Mm, okay. um, yeah, and then the other game is uh, one that I only actually found out about recently uh, called Okami, and it's you play as a Amaterasu in the form of a wolf. Yeah, yeah, I've heard of this. Yeah. And it's uh, it's very Zelda like. It's very uh, you know you go around and talk to everybody and you solve uh, their little problems and you do puzzles and dungeons. Um, but there's so much Japanese fol- folklore like just packed into it. Um, and yeah, and it's uh, it's like a really uh, fun like even just to to watch someone play it. It's uh, just a really nice game. That is really cool. Um... Cool. Is there anything else that kind of came to your mind after doing the? I know every time I do a panel afterwards, I'm like, ah, I forgot to mention this one thing. Anything like like that that's kind of on your mind? Uh, actually, yeah. So um, later in uh, the anime, uh, there's uh, Tenjin has like uh, if you. I remember like the first time I watched it. I think I just assumed it was like one of his regalia or something. Mm. Um, but then I looked it up. Uh, he has this special like plum tree lady that okay. helps him out. Um, and that's kind of a side story to his exile where he had this yeah. favorite plum tree that supposedly uprooted itself and flew to where he was in exile in order to be with him. Mm-hmm. And of course, there's a Tenjin shrine with the actual plum tree that supposedly flew there. Wow. Um, and like, you can see it in everything, um, and so I thought that was sort of nice that they um, incorporated that as well. That is really cool. Cool. Well, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it, and uh, hope to um, see more panels from you at future OnCons. Yeah, um, sounds good. Where can people find you? Oh, yeah. So uh, my Twitter is otuple one half. Um, my YouTube is just a tuple. You can also just type in um, hypnosis mic into the YouTube search and my most popular video will probably hey. pop up. <laughs> um, and yeah. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so uh, have a good weekend. Cool, all right, thank you so much. Uh, we're gonna switch over to um, to some um, uh, other stuff. We've got another panel coming up at 5 p.m. See you all there. All right.